Live from New York City, it's The Cube at Big Data NYC 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor, WAN Disco, with support from EMC, MarkLogic, and Teradata. Now, here is your host, Dave Vellante. Welcome back to Big Data NYC, everybody. I'm here with Jeff Frick. We've been going two days, Thursday and Friday, here at uh, Big Data NYC in, in conjunction with Strata Plus Hadoop World. Joseph Sarush is here. He's uh, with Microsoft and the Machine Learning Group, which is inside of the cloud group, I understand. Yes, uh, yes. So thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So you've been at the event. Uh, hopefully yes. traffic wasn't too bad getting over here. but. Yeah. Uh, What's it like over there? What's, how's the traffic at the Javits Center? Uh, very, uh, you know, it's amazing. I believe the conference has grown by a factor of two, you know, just from February of this year. It's amazing to see the traction big data and analytics is getting. Now, have you done other Hadoop worlds before? Or? Uh, not a, give a keynote, but today I did have a keynote. But, you know, Microsoft has always had a presence at these conferences. Oh, sure, right. But yes. you personally, yeah. this is no, your first I mean, one? No, this is my first one. So we're celebrating five years at Hadoop World. We, Mike Olson was here earlier oh, yes. in, uh, on theCUBE, yeah. and we were reminiscing about it was probably eight or 900 people. I think the very first one was 400. Yeah, that's right. And then the second one we had the Cube at, so it's really exploded, yeah. and a lot more enterprise people are, yeah. are, are coming over. So what was your keynote this morning? Yeah, the keynote was about a new data science economy. Um, and the point I was trying to make, you know, while um, software developers have had the app economy, uh, where software developers can go publish apps, self-service, and you can have huge wins like Instagram and WhatsApp, uh, data scientists, you know, in spite of being some of the smartest people, and, and what I'd like to think of as some of the smartest people around, me being a data scientist, by the way, um, they haven't had an outlet for their creativity. Now, you can't, data scientists don't build software apps. They build machine learning models. They build analytical systems. They build visualizations. They don't have an outlet to monetize these. And what I was talking about is about creating one such like that, right? So what's the equivalent of an app store for a data scientist? Uh, well, I believe personally that what you need to do is package up machine learning models and visualizations in cloud-hosted APIs. And when you have an API that you can use on the cloud as a service, it's a web service, well then you have something that people can pay for and buy. And so what I was talking about was, I took this example of a website that needs to integrate recommendations in. You know, building these uh, recommendations is, is a hard analytic job. Uh, it takes a data scientist to do that. But then there is another part that's equally hard. It's to build an API that hooks into that web page and then can handle the volume of traffic and reliably serve recommendations with every click. And that's a very hard part of the job. And companies that do it today, you know, like my former company, Amazon, they, they you know, have a lot of effort into you know, building some of those. Well, with the cloud, we can simplify these things dramatically. So I took that example and I showed how on the cloud with the machine learning product we have, you can build a recommendations API, publish that into a marketplace where you can actually start charging for that by usage, by per click. Um, and then anyone, you know, any particularly, practically any website could very easily with a little bit of JavaScript integrate that API in and get recommendations live in minutes. And so now you have something that is a seed of something that can be traded in a marketplace that has intelligent services on the cloud. And so we have this great product that we launched, we launched uh, in summer called Microsoft Azure Machine Learning uh, that allows you to now publish APIs that now can also be published into a marketplace and people can now start charging for it. And that's hugely empowering to data scientists. Well, the, the recommendation piece is, is quite interesting, yeah. right, because that you know, reputation, recommendation, you know, our, our, you know this, our social graph is now cutting across all kinds of activities that we do. Um, I want to, I have a question about, uh, from a data scientist perspective, it seems like historically industries build expertise within their domain. Retail people have retail expertise, financial services, insurance, manufacturing. We sort of stay there for 30, 40, 50 years, retire, and that's all, and that's all good. Data scientists seem to not want to get put into that vertical bucket. Is that a perception that's correct? Um, well, there are lots of data scientists in financial industry and so on that have actually grown up and have accumulated a great amount of domain knowledge. Mm. Uh, now, of course, there are lots of people who cross industries, 
Uh, by the way, financial industry in many ways was the birthplace of a lot of data science, yeah. really. Credit scores, sure. uh, you know, fraud detection. My first job 20 years back was credit card fraud detection using neural networks. Uh, so that was my, it was a very, uh, very interesting thing to do. Um, so but expensive. Uh, yes, <laughs> yeah. of course, yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and uh, um, but you know, I think data science hits its magic when you combine the magic of software and machine learning and all of these algorithms with domain expertise. Mm. Uh, so, but you know, we are actually taking a, a, a track to leverage those kinds of domain expertise as well to create a long tail selection of a lot of different kinds of machine learning APIs in the marketplace. See, the thing about these marketplaces, what's great is, instead of just having this one product that it tries to fit all, you get a lot of specific things. You might get a forecasting API for forecasting Wall Street time series, and another one for forecasting, hey, my sales, forecasting something else. There are lots of variations, and when they are customized to individual domains, they become very, very useful. Yeah, so that's, I guess, my, my point. I didn't put a frame correctly. but it seems like a data scientist wants data inputs from just outside that one slice. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why I put a broad the example of the social graph. There's other data inputs from maybe it's other industries, other sources, as opposed to sort of the historically having data just from that one slice. That I completely like, agree. And it seems and like so that is a new trend. It's indeed. an art <laughs> yes, form. You know? an art and form. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. It's, yeah. a, it's an observation that we've made that is, I think. Let me just take an example of forecasting demand on a, an online store, for example. You have products, right? Well, I mean, previously people would just take, hey, how much that product sold in the past, and then try to forecast yeah. out that demand. But today you have so many signals. You have tweets, for example. How much people are tweeting about those products? How much is, uh, is purchases of those products being shared on the social graph? Um, you have then search query signals. How much people are searching for these things? So you have so many other signals that you can now incorporate in. And like a lot of this data comes from different sources in the cloud. And if you're a data scientist running, say, machine learning in the cloud, like with Azure Machine Learning, you can pull in all of those kinds of data sources, integrate that in the cloud, and build this really accurate, fantastic uh, you know, forecasting models. And that adds a lot of power. Hmm. So um, it's interesting, the machine learning piece was, it was in, within, within Azure. Yeah. Um, talk about that a little bit. Microsoft's culturally, you know, Satya Nadella from the top down is really moving to the cloud and uh, uh, embracing the cloud. Your background is, is Amazon, yes. which yes, is quite course. interesting. Yeah. Talk about that culturally a little bit. Well, you mean culture from uh, coming to Microsoft? Yes. You know, by the way, Satya recruited me to uh, Microsoft, uh -huh. and you know, my passion has been machine learning, so I came over there to build this. In many ways, sort of I'm betting my career on building out this machine learning marketplace and making it a big success. Uh, it's actually uh, a, a new Microsoft, really. I mean, Satya and mm -hmm. others have really changed how Microsoft actually really sees itself. The challenger mindset, we are moving much faster. We've you know, structured ourselves to actually ship in much shorter cycles. So it's changed from, for example, shipping software in the traditional way, shipping it on a disk, package software you know, through these uh, channels, to now shipping things in the cloud. And these are live services that requires 24 by seven monitoring. And you know, the great thing about cloud services is you can take customer feedback live as opposed to these multi-year cycles for enterprise products. You can take customer feedback live and the product improves constantly, mm -hmm. right? So building these products that constantly improve and become better for the customer, that requires a sort of a new DNA and a customer focus and a way of thinking. And that's really happening under Satya's leadership. And that's really what excites me all the time. I mean, I, just as yeah. an outside observer, I've seen a dramatic change. Yes, absolutely. Um, it was almost like there was some resistance and then all of a sudden that resistance broke through like a dam breaking. And uh, which I, it's interesting to note, I think today's companies are much more open to change, at least recognize the, the need. Do you mm. agree with that? Well, perhaps, Large companies, I, mean, I mean, certainly uh, engineering companies like Microsoft, mm. if you look at the engineers, they, they know technology around them is changing at such a rapid pace. At their heart, they really want to move with the technology. I mean, no technologist wants to be outdated. I mean, we're, we're geeks, we play with stuff, we love the latest stuff that is coming out. We really want to really move fast, right? And so, in some ways, perhaps the change was not necessarily unexpected. It was just the leadership setting the orientation right. And then, you know, the engineers gravitating to what naturally comes to them in many ways. And perhaps that's why Microsoft seems to be changing quite fast, uh, as opposed to perhaps people with not as much of an engineering culture. But I think, I think uh, Microsoft is adapting and moving very fast. So it's top down and bottom up. 
Yeah, absolutely. At least certainly the engineering uh, folks have always felt this angst about they, they really want to win. Uh, they really <laughs> think, you know, and they, they should be at the cutting edge of technology. They are used to creating the path, and now, you know, they feel not uh, like others are creating the path, and they really are hungry to win. And so uh, they're eager to learn, they're eager to have the customer focus, they really want to adapt. I think, and with the new leadership, it just became really easy, so sort of the dam burst. So Joseph, talk about this, yeah. this kind of two sides of the coin where you're a data scientist, you've got a lot of data at your disposal, you're, you're, you're building algorithms for people to be able to rent and use and leverage, so, so you're smart. At the other end, there's never enough data scientists. Everyone complains there aren't enough data scientists. Exactly. I can't get them to come work for my company. Yeah. Um, and at the same time too, like Tableau's message, uh, another great Seattle company, you know, they want everyone to really use analytics in their decision making process and they really always kind of go back to you know, how Excel like can we make it mm. because that's what every, that's everybody's big data tool yeah, yeah. Uh, to jour. How do those things kind of come together where you leverage the power and the expertise of really smart guys like yourself and the algorithms and things that you can build, but at the same time enable you know, everyday line people to be more data centric in their decision making and to apply some of this to make their lives better and their businesses better. Yeah, no, great question. You know, I think, Jeff, uh, the answer is you need finished products that everybody can use. And uh, in one of my sessions earlier today, I made this example. I mean, I asked how many of you actually get your clothes tailored? Okay, I mean, in the olden days, people would buy clothes and get go to tailors. And it's sort of like the tailors are like the data scientists today, maybe. I mean, you go get your custom fit model that right, works right. for just you and your domain. And nobody does that anymore. Guess what? I mean, manufacturing clothes became so automated and so easy, and there's such an incredible selection of clothes available in all department stores that you can actually go to a department store, select the sort of things that you like, and by and large, it really works well on you, right? right, right. And so you need to create something like that. There are finished shirts that I can buy, and what's the equivalent of that for data scientists? So if I am a company that wants a recommendation API, you know, I should be able to go to a store and there should be a, a thousand recommendation APIs from which I can select the one that suits mm. my need the best. So I shouldn't have to really hire data scientists or have a tailor equivalent, right? right? I shouldn't have to have my own tailors or my data scientists. I should be able to go to a store and actually get what I want, right? And so now the th question is, how do you create a million APIs that are finished products in the cloud, right? So I have enough of a selection, enough of a diversity, that you know, vast majority of people can get what they want. And I think that's the way really we need to go. And instead of making tailoring more, well, you can go two ways, right? You can make tailoring simpler, right. and you can empower them to, you know, that's an Excel-like thing. That's one way to go. Or you can say, hey, I don't really need tailors that many anymore. Tailors are in short supply anyway. Why don't we just get mass of manufacturing shirts. of clothes? Right. So right. I can just get the selection I want. Right. And what's the monetization model? I, you've mentioned that before. It's, but it's by usage, so, so if it's a recommendations API, the recommendations API is used per click, and for a certain number of clicks, you charge a certain dollar amount, right? Yeah. I mean, so it's just pay by usage. Right, and I can cap my yeah, utility model. I'm in control. Exactly, yeah. And then it, I have to pay only what I use. I don't have to, I mean, like, otherwise you have this lots of fixed investment. In this particular case, you're just subscribing to an API and you pay for what you use. I think that's a very revolutionary model. Well, it's, and it's such a great example, right? Yeah. I mean, you go to Yelp, you go to TripAdvisor, and you, Amazon, and it's, yeah. just, it's still valuable use. You, you know, and it's just, you, you can you even learn to, 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 to decode the recommendations and you can that's build it. your own system as, exactly. a, as a user. Exactly, and yeah, yeah. And by the way, th I don't think there is one recommendations algorithm or one recommendations API, I actually think there should be a thousand, right? Yeah. There will be a lot of diversity in the kind of recommendations people want. I mean, I say, you know, recommending wine is not the same as recommending a book, right? It's just different in character, right? And people who know wine should create a recommendations API for wine, and people who know books should create a recommendations API for books, and people who know clothes should create a recommendations API for those. But this oh, kind of, this gets, kind of to, gets to the first question that I ask in your response. So yeah. there's this, it's the domain expertise, but the, the, the fundamental code, in this case, can traverse can domains. traverse many domains. And then right. be applied. If you and want to tailor the sure. suit, great. You yeah. know, but, yeah. but this base code can go right. across any industry, for example, or yeah. any use yeah. case. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know, that's very yeah. powerful. That's yeah. different. The data becoming a transport, that's you right. know, the horizontal yeah. transport. Yeah, and, and so what we want to create right in the cloud yeah. is this factory for intelligent services. Think about it that way, right? 
It's like the clothes factory, right? And so I've, I've created a platform, the Microsoft Azure Machine Learning Platform, and the marketplace to publish it into. So this, this should be the factory in which data scientists come, create a large number of intelligent services that then appear in this marketplace. And that's a store where you as customers, ordinary people would go, get those APIs, connect it into Excel if that's where you want to use it, connect to a website if that's where you want to use it, and you just go. And that's, that's how economies take shape. Well, right, and why would anybody develop that in-house? Why wouldn't they just move right. up the stack and focus on their business model right. and right. transform I mean, and that? Exactly, I mean, so you should hire a, a tailor when you have a specific need, when, you need when, you're, when you're going to have a wedding, then you spend the money yeah, to yeah, get yeah. your clothes tailored. Yeah, yeah. Rest of the time, you consume what's out there and they work yeah. by and large for you, and in any way, the business is so dynamic these days that you're better off you know, tapping in the van as opposed to these slower cycles of building everything from the ground up, at least for the vast majority of companies. Right. So Joseph, another thing I want to get your kind of one-on-one on is, is again, smart data scientists dealing with a lot of data, uh -huh. right? But then there's the human factors of, and, and people talk about visualization, but to me, I mean, how do you make a billion of anything really um, cognizant to me to be able to make a logical decision based on such a big data set. Mm. Uh, and, and how are kind of the human factors being now applied to machine learning and data science to let regular people actually be able to make cognizant decisions based on a billion data points? And you know, you see some of these visualizations and they look pretty, but it's like, well, how's, how's that telling me where I'm supposed to go with my next decision? Yeah. Um, and, and you know, to tell you the truth, I mean, I, I don't think beyond a point these visualizations are all that useful. I think you do need good hypothesis testing and you really need the ability to understand scientifically whether there is a nugget there or what you should be seeing. Because, you know, data points are like stars in the sky. You can see anything you want. Right. You can see, you know, it's whatever exactly visualizations you have. You can see all sorts of constellations. And in many ways sometimes, in fact, there was a wonderful speaker today uh, from NPR uh, at Hadoop World who was talking about how data can be used in so many misleading ways that you can substantiate your position, anyone's position using sure, data. Sure. And that's why Mark Twain said famously, there's lies, damn lies, and statistics. Right, right, and how to lie with statistics, right? <laughs> yes, exactly. And, and so, <laughs> I always thought that was Disraeli, okay. <laughs> no, no, it is, I, I Disraeli repeated that, Mark yeah, Twain. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Disraeli ripped off Twain, okay. That's right. Like Kennedy ripped off Cicero. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Ask yeah, not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And, and so that's the thing about pretty pictures, right? You can make uh, pretty pictures to substantiate any viewpoint you like sometimes. Right, right. Uh, uh, yeah. And the other thing that I think is interesting, we had a great conversation with, with a professor from Cal who's mm -hmm. a mathematician, and mm -hmm. he talked about you know mathematics and statistics is very different than computer science because everything is wrapped with an error bar, right? right? There's a confidence level. There is no yes, no, right, wrong, binary correct. switch, one, zero. Yeah. It's yeah. all probability yeah. with a confidence yeah. level. And, and the two of those worlds are now crashing together that is in true. the paradigm of data science yeah, and, and actually trying to drive decisions based on correlation, not necessarily causality. That's, that's absolutely true, and that's so absolutely true. And like, I, as one example, uh, again, in, my, in the past, when we used to do forecasting, uh, let's say I forecast that your book, Jeff, is going to sell 20 units next week. It's never going to be 20 units, right? It's going to be, there's going to be error bar around it. Right. There's going to be a variance, a distribution, and in fact, you know, somebody, if a store where to Barnes & Noble were to stock only 20 units, maybe 50% of the time they'll be out of stock because right. there's an error bar around right. it. What you really need sort of is that distribution of the error bar so you can stock to a level where you maybe sell out only 10% of the time, right? right? So that probability is actually an integral part of this whole thing and it's incredibly important to use that as well in making decisions. And you know, we're just getting used to making decisions based on probabilities. Right. Most people, I'll find it an uncertain Right, way. just the big right. database decisions, yeah. right, instead of gut decisions. That, that's still, that's still yeah. an evolving process, I think. That's right, yeah. Let's say there's some college students in the audience and they mm -hmm. want to know, what makes a good data scientist? Where should I start if I'm interested in data science? Yeah, I know, that's a great question. I think uh, if you are a good data scientist, you really have a curiosity for unearthing patterns in the data. You really love munging the data but you have, you're really good at coming up with a lot of hypotheses, and you know how to test them. You have lots of ideas, and, but you don't know that any particular hypothesis is right, 
you come up with ways of testing hypothesis. And then you come up with uh, ways of yeah, de deriving patterns that in some way predict the future better. Like, you, you know, what are the patterns that are truly predictive of what will happen in the future and what's noise and you can separate them and so on. So that skill is what you need to develop. But then you need a lot of tools for it. You need to know statistics. You need to be facile with uh, a fair bunch of coding. You need to go, go learn Python or R. R is the language of data science today. And you need to know a bit of SQL because you typically need to go to databases and extract data. And then you need to know how to pull data from the web. So learning a collection of these skills and then being able to derive insights from the data, that's really what a data scientist does. Mm. Uh, but you know, uh, to students, look, it, this is actually not any harder than AP statistics. Data science and machine learning, I mean, they have this aura of being very new. But you know, reality is it's something that is actually a lot simpler than many AP classes that you might take. Uh -huh. uh, by the way, I'll tell you another story. You know, like some of the earliest things in data science, like uh, the least squares method, was invented by Gauss at the age of 18 in 1795. <laughs> and he was trying to see patterns <laughs> in the stars. Tell me more about that. Okay. Yeah, no, he was trying to see patterns in the stars. So the, the big data they had at that time yeah. were how planets were moving in the sky. Mm. And so he had to fit, uh, you know, mathematically and find out what the patterns in the sky were and how these planets were moving. And so he invented what was called the least squares method at that time at the you know, tender age of 18. And that's how, you know, in some ways, data science started. How, how important is, to, is it to be unbiased? Uh, well, uh, you have to be a scientist. I mean, everybody has to be unbiased, right? But data science is a scientific method. The goal is to ap apply science to data. And so if you are a scientist, by definition, you have to be unbiased. You have to be objective. You have to be experimenting. You have to discover insights by experimentation. And you have to, uh, you know, when you have a hypothesis, you have to be equally on the side of proving it or disproving it. Right? And that's what data scientists I worry about. about data science abuse, data scientist abuse. Somebody For comes sure. down and says, I want to show this. Find me the data that shows, you know, A, a, a is related to, to B. Said, but you, <laughs> can't, you can't find the data. Right, that right. supports a point of view. You could do that. Right? Right. I mean, you can yeah. absolutely do that. It's, yeah. it's, uh, so I, I don't think there's such a thing as pure unbiased. Now, you can certainly test a hypothesis and then accurately decide whether that hypothesis is proven or disproven. And even again, that's, that's, a, that's a probability too, right? 0.05, but you know 0 .1. organizations will abuse that capability and try to Absolutely. You know, and, <laughs> yeah, and coax you know, the data scientists. Even, even sometimes when you have two political parties, each party can use data to substantiate their point of view however they like. I mean, it's actually sometimes very hard to disprove, right? Right. And so uh, that, that is the world in which we live. Yeah. Uh, so we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't take data for granted that data is the truth, uh, because at the end of the day, it is the derived hypothesis from that data, and who derives it, and what their original point of view is, that's coloring the interpretation at the end of the day, so you do have to be careful. The data doesn't lie, people do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph, thanks very much for so coming on the cube. Really a pleasure, pleasure having you, really. Yeah, nice meeting you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Jeff Frick and I will be right back right after this word. This is the cube.